This week's episode is brought to you by Fairy Godmother Travel. Contact them at Communicore Weekly at FairyGodmotherTravel.com to help plan out all of your Disney vacation needs. Hello and welcome to Communicore Weekly, the greatest online show and home of the world's first pair of independently born identical twins. I'm George. And I'm Jeff. And what's up? Cool. Oh, nothing much. Oh. Just sitting here, hanging out. Oh, that was a delayed Chilling response. for a while. Oh, was it? It was. Like, me delayed or, like, internet delayed? I don't know. Maybe both. Maybe both. <laughs> I have to have the listeners... What happened? Tell us we, what happened there. Yeah, I'll let us know. It could be either way at this point. <laughs> anyway, I think that's enough of a ramble for us. Let's just go into yes. the episode. It's time for Disney History. Over the years, some of Hollywood's handsome leading men, such as Douglas Fairbanks and Sean Connery, Kevin Costner, George Taylor, and more, they've all taken on the role of the legendary English folk hero, Robin Hood. Well, maybe minus one of them. <laughs> um, but today, the one we're going to be talking about is a real fox, literally. And that, of course, is British theater actor Brian Bedford, who voiced Robin Hood in the animated film uh, released by Disney in 1973. Robin Hood, which was conceived by Ken Anderson, written by Larry Clemens, and directed by Wolfgang Reitherman, was only the third animated film to be released following Walt's death in 1966, and it's one of the last to have his personal influence on the production. From the earliest days at the Disney Studios, Walt had wanted to base the film on the story Reynard the Fox, a European folktale that originated you know, sometime in the 10th and 11th centuries. This was around the time when stories were created in which animal characters were used to create satires of human experiences. Now, Reynard was a sly and deceiving figure who had manipulated his way out of challenging situations, thus gaining a degree of sympathy from the audience, but whose predicaments often resulted in the death of those around him. So, obviously not the, you know, the character that you want to believe in for a <laughs> Disney film. So, for a number of years, Walt really tried in vain to find enough noble qualities in Reynard to build a suitable story. But ultimately, it was decided to shift attention to the equally crafty, but much better intended character of Robin Hood, whose policy of robbing the rich and giving to the poor, and defying the ruthless in power, made for a more respectable anti-hero. In, in the 1950s, Disney animator Ken Anderson put together a potential script and preliminary drawings in anticipation of the Renard film. When focus shifted to Robin Hood, they realized that many of Anderson's drawings could still be utilized, uh, because by making the sly and cunning Robin, Robin Hood a fox would work perfectly. So the film was presented as the Robin Hood legend from an animal's point of view, with the animators correlating the characters with their human counterparts. For example, King Richard the Lionheart would, could only be portrayed as a lion, of course, and his brother Prince John was as well. Little John's name was a joke regarding his notable size, so he was turned into a large bear. Now, let's just take a step back a little bit and learn about the origins of the story to begin with. The earliest known mention of Robin Hood was in a Baldalic poem called Pierce Plowman, written by William Langland in the late uh, 14th century. A reference was made to the rhymes of Robin Hood in the poem, but nothing earlier than this mention could be found. Uh, in a history of Scotland written in the 14th and 15th century called the Scottic Chronicon, which is Ooh. either the name of a great convention or like a dark book, um, <laughs> also mentioned a bandit Robin Hood with Little John and their accomplices. So it's got a Scottish Chronicon be Scottish people that like time? Uh, or maybe. watches, maybe? Scottish it's like the watches. Necronomicon. Like if you read from it, yeah. it Scotsmen yeah. appear. And they tell you the time? Yes. Okay, good. All right, well, speaking of time, around 1500, 
<laughs> I tried. The year, nice. the year, not the time. The Jest of Robin Hood was published, which was the first significant telling of Robin Hood's story in print. This means that a character named Robin Hood was found both in fictional and non-fictional works. So was Robin Hood real? Unfortunately, there is no confirmation regarding Robin's actual existence, though a man named Robert Hode, H-O-D-E, who lived as an outlaw around Yorkshire in the early 13th century, may be a strong contender. Real or not, it doesn't really matter, because Robin Hood's antagonist in the stories was England's Prince John, who did indeed exist. Now, Prince John was the younger brother of King Richard I, called the Lionheart, who reigned from 1189 to 1199. Richard led the British armies during the Crusades, and while he was away in battle, Prince John ruled in his place. John continually plotted against his brother in hope of gaining the throne for himself, and was basically despised by the English people for his rampant raising of taxes, which were collected by the local sheriffs. And in Robert, uh, Robin's case, the Sheriff of Nottingham, who was just as ruthless and hated as his employer. I know the Sheriff of Nottingham was played by the guy from Die Hard and Snape. I mean, come on, he... Couldn't have been good. I mean, yes. We'll right? go with that. Yes. Okay, we'll just say that. All right, so so Disney's first foray into the tale of Robin Hood was not animated, however. In 1952, Disney released the live-action film The Story of Robin Hood and His Merry Men. Unlike the animated movie, in which Robin was already an established outlaw with a band of allies and fans, the live-action film showed the onset of the rivalry between Robin and the Sheriff of Nottingham at an archery match his subsequent gathering of the Merry Men, and their fight against the Sheriff and Prince John. Mixed into the story were Robin's efforts to show his loyalty to King Richard, and of course, his courtship of Maid Marian. Um, Irish actor Richard Todd starred as Robin, Joan Rice portrayed Maid Marian, and Peter Finch was the Sheriff of Nottingham. The film was actually later edited and shown in two segments as part of Walt Disney's Wonderful World of Color in 1955. The musical score for the story of Robin Hood and his Merry Men was composed by Clifton Parker, who also wrote the music for Disney's Treasure Island in 1950 and episodes of The Wonderful World of Color. Songs crooned by the character Alan Adele were composed by Elton Hayes, who also portrayed the minstrel Merry Men. So this formula was repeated in the animated version of Robin Hood, as Roger Miller both portrayed Alan Adele and wrote the songs Alan sang, which were Odalali, uh, Whistle Stop, and Not in Nottingham. And two other composers were hired to complete the music for the animated film. Uh, George Bruns, the, music, uh, the movie's musical director, wrote the score, as well as Maid Marian's ballad Love, with uh, had lyrics by Floyd Huddleston. Uh, and that song was actually nominated for an Academy Award the year it came out. And speaking of Academy Awards, Academy Award-winning songwriter Johnny Mercer filled out the score with The Phony King of England. Joining Roger Miller was a voice cast that featured an interesting mix of accents from both the Commonwealth and the American South. Uh, many tried-and-true Disney veterans joined forces with animation newcomers to tell the story of the legendary figure. Brian Bedford, who voiced the title role, portrayed a number of small television and film roles in the United Kingdom and the United States, before and after his work on Robin Hood. On this side of the Atlantic, however, he was, he was and is primarily known for his work on the Broadway stage, uh, including winning the 1971 Tony Award for Best Actor in the play The School of Wives. And he even owned a, uh, earned a Tony nomination recently in 2011 for The Importance of Being Earnest. And it should be no surprise that Maid Marian and Lady Cluck had excellent chemistry. Robin Hood was the second Disney film credit for their actresses, Monica Evans and Carol Shelley, who also played sisters Abigail and Amelia Gabble, the gossipy geese in the Aristocats. In addition, they played sisters Cecily and Gwendolyn Pigeon in the Broadway film and television versions of The Odd Couple. Two-time Academy Award-winning British actor Peter uh, Ustinov voiced uh, the Prince John character, as well as his noble brother Richard the Lionheart. Now, Prince John's sidekick, Sir Hiss, was portrayed by London-born comedian Terry Thomas. Thomas was well known for the gap in his front, uh, front top teeth, so the uh, animators actually incorporated that into the character. So not only did that mimic the actor, but it also provided a gateway for Sir Hiss's tongue to come out in, of his mouth. So Phil Harris was already well known to Disney fans when he signed on to play Robin's right-hand man, Little John. Harris had made his Disney debut in 1967 with The Jungle Book, and Robin Hood audiences quickly noticed the similarities between Baloo the Bear and Little John, and had charmed his future Robin Hood co-stars Monica Evans and Carol Shelley as 
Thomas O'Malley in the Aristocats. Another Aristocats uh, veteran, Pat Buttram, who had voiced Napoleon in the earlier film, played the Sheriff of Nottingham, a highly regarded character actor. He was known for his roles in the television series Petticoat Junction, Green Acres, and Love, American Style. His later Disney film work included Luke in The Rescuers and Chief in Fox and the Hound. And then there were two beloved television actors with very distinctive draws that were tapped to play the bumbling vultures Trigger and Nutsy. Uh, George Lindsay, who played Trigger, had been in the Aristocats, but was known better to audiences as Gober uh, Pyle in both The Andy Griffith Show and in its spin-off, Mayberry R.I.D. And he also appeared numerous times on the Cowboy series Gunsmoke, which starred Ken Curtis, who was the voice of Nutsy. And some of the smaller roles, both in the size of the part and the character, were portrayed by actors with large Disney resumes. John Fieldler, who voiced the Sexton, had played Piglet in the short film Winnie the Pooh and the Blustery Day. He reprised the role in Winnie the Pooh and Tigger 2 and The Many Adventures of Winnie the Pooh. He continued to provide the voice of Piglet throughout the Winnie the Pooh features of the next few decades, as well as on the television series, The, uh, the New Adventures of Winnie the Pooh, until his death in 2005. His Winnie the Pooh co-star, uh, Barbara Luddy, voiced both, both Mother Rabbit and Mother Church Mouse in Robin Hood. And her extensive list of Disney credits included uh, Lady and Lady and the Tramp, Meriwether and Sleeping Beauty, and Rover in 101 Dalmatians. And other Disney veterans filling out the cast were Jay Pat O'Malley as Otto the Dog with the Broken Leg, and Candy Candido as the Captain of the Guards. Adventure, romance, and the victory of the righteous weak over the tyrannical strong all blended together with the magic of Disney animation with this combination. And it's easy to see why 40 years after its original release, Robin Hood continues to delight fans of all ages. Now before you go into the end, do you remember yes. the, the whistle that he did? Which one, Sir Hiss or Robin Hood? Robin Hood. No, go ahead and do it. Oh, from, from yeah, yeah, okay, okay. That one. I thought the one that you, when he called all the cadets to arms. Oh, oh, that's a secret one. We can't reveal that one. Yet. Yeah, we can't reveal that one yet. So, okay. Um, <laughs> well, we'd like to oh hear your rendition of Robin Hood's whistle. Oh, that's yeah, interesting. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, call us on the Communicore Weekly Goat line. Of course, tell us what you think about Robin Hood. Of course, we'd love to hear that. But we'd also love to hear your rendition of the whistle. So call us at 424-785-4628. That's 424-785-GOAT. He's a nerd, he's a, nerd. He's a, geek. He's a geek, but we all like to hear him speak. So listen up to the words from his speech. Ah. It's George's Book of the Week. This week's book is Kem Weber, Designer and Architect by Chris Long. So in case you aren't familiar with Kem Weber, he was an architect and an industrial stylist or designer that helped usher in what we would now call the mid-century modern feel that sort of started in the 1930s. He was also the architect responsible for designing the Walt Disney Studios in Burbank. And not just the studios, but also the grounds, you know, the entire complex, and many of the equipment, like the chairs and the tables and all the electric stuff running around. And obviously, you know, when I looked at the table of contents, which you may or may not be able to see right now, the, the book doesn't look exclusively at Weber's work at Disney. So most casual Disney fans aren't going to want to invest in this title. But fans of architecture, fans of mid-century design, and people who'd like to learn a little bit more about the architecture are going to really like this book. So to me, it was quite an interesting look at an architect who, uh, for lack of a better term, and, and how he became extremely important with modern sensibilities in the 1920s. And for me, it's hard to imagine the growth of the style because it's always been there. And it's something that, though, this book does very well. It shows Weber from his early beginnings in Germany to when he made his way over to the United States to help with the San Francisco ex Exposition, so tying in the World Fairs again, and how he sort of got stuck in the United States because of the outbreak of World War I. Um, it talks about how he developed this art form in architecture as well as in furniture, and how he was sort of at the forefront of this wave of modernism. And of course, throughout the book, you realize there is a lot of anti-German sentiment because he was very, he did a lot of work during World War I and World War II. And there wasn't a lot of, there was a lot of anti-German sentiment going on in all fields, basically. Okay, so he did get some contracts in the 20s, and he did work on some simple displays and actually designed an entire store 
almost right from the get-go. And it became huge, and it exploded across the country, basically, this idea of the modern furniture. And he became the go-to person. He lectured all over the country. He wrote articles. He met people all over the world and still had issues with getting his furniture and his designs actually bought and purchased. The Depression hit him, like everybody else, the Great Depression, and you know almost did him and his family in, but he was able to get a few contracts. And the book goes and talks about that a lot. Um, the section, though, that most people are going to be interested in on the Burbank Studios was, was fairly interesting, but it wasn't as complete as I'd like to see, especially for Disney fans. Uh, Ken Weber himself did not keep a lot of the details because this was being built at the end of the 30s when he was extremely popular. And I really would have liked to have seen more information um, about, you know, why Walt Disney chose him, why Walt and Roy chose him to build this complex. What had they seen previously of his plans or his design, or did they just hear something? So I'd still like a little bit more in-depth from them, but it was nice to see the Disney Studios and the overall or overarching, uh, his, his work, his to the totality of his work, basically, to see how he went from his early designs past the Disney Studios to what he did in the 50s and the 60s as well, to see that evolution for his opus. That's what I was looking for early, earlier, his opus. That's a good word, opus. It's a good word. I like it. I like it. So, um, But you also find out that even though he was still in charge of designing the Walt Disney Studios, or the, Walt still came in and changed things and did his own designs, even though he was paying Weber all of this money to do it. So you still get a glimpse of Walt is being totally in control of everything. So the rest of the book does look at all the houses and all the different projects, including a lot of furniture. And you should Google the airplane chair because that's one that he created that's pretty famous. Um, a lot of his buildings and houses are still standing today, which is nice. A lot of them, of course, in Southern California. And as I said, I'd like to have seen more information about why Disney chose him. It's probably my only drawback with the book itself. And it does get pretty dense into some architecture related terms, but nothing that was too bad. So still, I think, you know, fans of just plain Disney or the Disney films or the theme parks aren't going to find much here. But I still wanted to cover it because it does talk about the Disney Studios, which is kind of neat to see that. So if you have an interest in architecture, especially Southern California architecture or mid-century modern, then this might be a book that you want to check out. It's called Kem Weber. Designer and Architect by Chris Long. Sometimes it's a one, sometimes it's a two. When you gotta go, what you gonna do? It's a bathroom break. A bathroom break. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm here at the Wizarding World of Harry Potter at Universal Studios Hollywood, and it's a live bathroom break. It's a little weird. I'm kind of standing by the middle, but you can hear Moaning Myrtle here. Um, you'll be happy to know their manual flush. That you can flush in your own terms here at the Wizarding World of Harry Potter. Very nice, a little dark in there, but fun. Um, come check it out for yourself. It'll be a good time. And I'll see you later. You might see it, sometimes you don't. Hey, look, what's that? It's a five-legged goat. As we discuss in the history section, uh, Robin Hood has some really good music, and whistling for that matter. Um, but the film also uses two well-known college fight songs during the chaos following the Tournament of the Golden Arrow. The University of Southern California's Tight On is played during the chase, and On Wisconsin from the University of Wisconsin-Madison is used during the scene in which Lady Cluck, not Gluck, Lady Cluck is fights <laughs> off Prince John's men in the simulated football game. Because Lady Gluck makes so much more sense. I mean, it does. It really does. I mean, if you it know really Keith, does. guys. Yeah, exactly, exactly. We love I him. couldn't come up with a segue because I was so, so, throw, so thrown off by the sports. You can't even, you can't even talk because couldn't of the Couldn't even get the, the words the out because it was the sports. I got confused, and I know that my brother Andrew said whenever sports come out, just yell, go Bucks," and I'll be okay. Is that how that works? I don't know what that means. I don't know what that means either. 
But we probably just had a bunch of people shouting Ohio State stuff at the at their MP3 player. Oh, okay, fair enough. I have no idea. I don't so, know what any of that means. I don't know. Was it Ohio State? I don't know. There's some theme parks in Ohio State. Hey, now we're talking. I know that much. Um, <laughs> so obviously, with that very bad segue, because it really wasn't a segue at all, we are at the year of a million or so limited time cadets prize winner announcement. Hooray! Yay! And as a reminder, you just have to email communicorweekly at gmail.com. Tell us your name, your address, and your birthday so you can be entered into the prize. We still have a few more months to go. We do. At least to the end of the year, but we're getting closer. This week's prize pack is a wonderful Fairy Godmother Travel sponsored prize pack from <laughs> Teresa Corey. I was trying to say prize pack as many as I can. I can tell. We get can. paid by an exactly. nickel at a time. I wish. So this week's winner is Matt T. from Killeen, Texas. Hooray, Yay. Matt T. And I should have should have read it with my Texas accent. You should have, or laugh I had thereof. a shout out on Twitter that somebody really enjoyed my Texas accent and oh, said man. I could move to Texas and fit right in. Yeah, you, you keep thinking that, George. Yeah, okay. Well, anyway, thank you guys so much for watching and listening to another episode of Communicore Weekly. And, you know, however you get the show, if you listen to us on iTunes, maybe leave us a rating there, or on YouTube, leave us a comment. We'd love to hear what you thought. Yep, and email us at communicorweekly at gmail.com because there's still plenty of time to enter the contest. You can also like us on the Facebook at facebook.com slash communicorweekly. And follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Periscope. I'm at Imaginerding. He's at Jeff Heimbach. And of course, give us a call on the Communicore Weekly Goat Line at 424-785-4628. And make sure to visit the Communa Store on CommunicoreWeekly.com where you can buy some awesome t-shirts and Communicore Weekly the Musical. And you can also send away for your uh, cadet membership card still or stickers. Just send a self-addressed stamped envelope to Communicore Weekly, P.O. Box 432, Orange, California, 92856. And visit patreon.com slash imaginerding to find out how you two can support, not imaginerding, Communicore Weekly. <laughs> Close enough. I had to throw something in there so people knew where it was from. So patreon.com slash Communicore Weekly to find out how you two can support the greatest online show. For Jeff Heimbuck, I'm George Taylor. And for George Taylor, I'm Jeff Heimbuck. Thanks so much for listening, guys and gals. We'll see you next time on Communicore Weekly, the greatest online show. Breakfast.